Hello, everyone, and welcome to AISC's live webinar, Stiffners and Doublers Oh My, presented by Carol Drucker. Today is July 12, 2018. My name is Nate Gonner. I'm with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Carol Drucker. Carol Drucker is Principal of Drucker Zidel Structural Engineers in Chicago, Illinois. She has worked extensively on the structural design of many connection projects throughout the country and is recognized as an industry leader. She received her bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Purdue University and her master's degree in structural engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. She has authored articles on connection design and currently serves on AISC's Committee on Specifications as well as Task Committees on Connection Design and the Task Committee on Editorial Economy Efficiency and Practical Use. Carol, thank you very much for being here. I will now turn the floor over to you. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be giving today's presentation on stiffeners and doublers. I do suspect many of the people out there have been on projects with doubler or stiffler controversies. Today we're going to discuss exactly why doubler and stiffener controversies occur on projects and the information needed to help prevent them from occurring on future projects. We also are going to discuss the cost and design of stiffeners and doublers. To first understand why doubler issues occur on projects, it's important to know exactly what a doubler is and why it is required. A doubler is a plate in a member, such as a beam or a column, used to reinforce the member for the required load. Although it can be certainly used to reinforce for such limit states as web yielding, web crippling, and web buckling, today's presentation is mainly going to focus on doubler plates used to reinforce a column for shear in a column panel zone. At lateral beam to column flange moment connections, the top flange of a beam acts one way, and the bottom flange of the beam acts the other way. And it is that distance between these flanges in the column that is subject to an increased shear load due to the flange forces. And is this area what we call the column panel zone. You can certainly use doublers for other applications, such as to reinforce a coat beam, or for shear at chevron connections. And if you think about it, a chevron brace connection is very similar to a beam to column flange moment connection, except that the gusset is moment connected to the chevron beam. Or at welded up truss connections. If you are designing a welded up truss connections with heavy W14 members and stiffeners are required, odds are pretty good that doublers will also need, be needed. Omer Blodgett's book, Design of Welded Structures, has an excellent example on how to design for doublers at welded up truss connections. All right, a coat beam is really easy to see what's going on and why a doubler might be required. You have a section, you have coat in it, you lose area. You check the coat section for all the applicable limit states, shear yielding, shear rupture, block shear, flexural yielding, and flexural buckling. Whatever the coat section can't resist, the balance of the force is, is resisted by the doubler. Simply design the doubler to resist the balance of the force. It's fairly straightforward. Now, it being the column flange moment connections, these behave a bit different. To explain what's happening at a beam to column flange moment connection, it's helpful to look at an example commonly used in steel tech. And that is where an end of a girder is checked for an increased shear load due to a column bearing on the top flange. Now, if you recall from school, the vertical and horizontal shear stress at each point are equal. I do think that is re worth repeating. So the vertical and horizontal shear stress at each point are equal. And it is this horizontal shear stress that we call shear flow or VQ over IT. And if we look at the shear stress diagram, we see that it varies across the depth of the member. And at the junction of the flange and the web, there is this spike in shear stress. And that is because 
The shear stress equation is VQ over IT, where T is the width of the element along the depth of the member. And at the intersection of the beam flange and the beam web, there is a decrease in width, hence an increase in stress. The same thing happens at beam to column flange MOMA connections where the beam flange applies a point load to the column. You look at the shear stress diagram and you see that same increase in shear stress at the junction of the column flange and column web. And it is for this reason, if doublers are required at beam to column flange MOMA connections, they are either groove welded into the column radius or welded to the column flange. There's a handful of doubler configurations commonly used. I'll try this one. There's a handful of doubler com uh, configurations commonly used. In our office, we will typically use the top two configurations, either a doubler that is flush to the column weld and then groove welded into the column radius, or we will. This one actually works out really good. And we'll see later in the presentation just how cost effective. A thickened doubler that is prepped to clear the column radius. This can be a very cost effective option. If there is no infill beam framing into the member web, we have also used this offset symmetric option. Probably the least fabricator friendly of the bunch would be the offset doubler with a spacer plate. That's probably uh, the least fabricator friendly option. When we're working on a job and if doublers are required, one of the first questions we'll ask. The fabricator is what is the maximum thickness they would like to use before the doubler thickness is cut in half and one is placed on each side of the column web. Typically, that answer is anywhere between a half an inch to five eighths. All right. So the current go-to reference for doubler plate design is Design Guide 13, written by Charlie Carter. Although Bo Doswell does have an upcoming EJ article where he's done testing of various doubler configurations. Now this article has not been published yet, but uh, I've read it, and the findings within this article are consistent with Design Guide 13. Design Guide 13 discusses two types of doubler design, a flush doubler and a doubler that is thickened and prepped to clear the column radius. If you are designing a thickened doubler, be careful because the effective thickness of the doubler might not be the total thickness of the plate. The effective thickness of the doubler is defined as the thickness at the toe of the fillet weld, distance right here. So when you're sizing the weld, you have two things to check. You have to check the weld for strength, and then you have to check the, the, the fillet weld leg size to make sure it is large enough to provide the minimum effective thickness of the, of the doubler. And it is for that reason, if the leg size controls, it can be more cost effective to increase the doubler thickness and provide this land than to increase the fillet weld size. We typically will do that within reason, trying to get to a single pass fillet weld size along the column flange. All right, for the flush doubler configurations, Design Guide 13, in both articles, both discuss two configurations, one for thin doublers and one for thick. Thin doublers are defined as anything between a quarter to three-eighths and under, and thick doublers are anything over a quarter to three-eighths inch thick. For thin doublers, both Design Guide 13 and both article indicate it is acceptable to provide a square cut doubler and to help reduce the weld metal it is acceptable to have some override into the column radius. Although square cut doubler is acceptable, some fabricators still prefer to prep the doubler edge anywhere between 5 to 20 degrees just to allow for more access at the root of the weld. Now the amount of encroachment varies from fabricator to fabricator. Most common there is a table in part 10 of the manual that gives the acceptable encroachment based on K detailing and thickness of the flange of the column. I would say this is the most common encroachment used. However, some fabricators do prefer to use a reduced encroachment somewhere between an eighth to three sixteenths, and I suspect that is 
possibly due to column underrun or just to have better access to the root of the weld. Now for the thick doublers, it's basically the same exact thing, same thing, except for thick doublers, then the edge of the doubler does need to be prepped back. And the most common prep back is I would say 20 degrees is the most common, although certain fabricators do prefer to increase that to 30 degrees to allow for more access at the root of the weld. Okay, so the problem with both of these doubler weld configurations is that Design Guide 13 calls these a non-pre-qualified CJP weld. And if this weld is considered a CJP weld, all you have to do is write CJP in the tail of the weld symbol. If this is classified as a CJP weld, then along for the ride is usually that UT testing is required. Although some fabricators have successfully tested these welds, others have, have not been so lucky. And part of the problem is, as the doubler overrides the radius, a gap forms between the front face of the column and the back side of the doubler. And it is due to this gap, there can be very questionable UT results. Well, the good news is, that the current 2016 AWS D1.8, which is the seismic supplement to AWS D1.1, now contains a pre-qualified doubler weld configuration. Although AWS does remain intentionally vague where this, if this is a CJP weld requiring UT testing or a PJP groove weld, the 2016 seismic provisions do designate this weld as a full strength PJP weld not requiring UT testing. So this is actually very good news. This is a reproduction out of AWS D1.8 showing the doubler weld configuration. And we can see for flux core arc welding or gas metal arc welding, it's probably most commonly used, that the prep of the doubler is 30 degrees, and there can be no override into the radius of the column. If the fabricator prefers to reduce the weld metal by using a reduced prep or some amount of override, this is acceptable. They just have to do three macro edge tests to show that there is complete fusion between the different layers of weld metal and between the weld metal and the base metal, and that there is no cracking in the weld. What's a macro edge test? I also had this question. You can simply look on YouTube for an example of a macro edge test. YouTube is actually an excellent reference if you want to see any kind of weld testing done. Is it a big, de big deal for the fabricators to do a macro edge test? Well, one fabricator we talked to said absolutely not. I do it all the time. It's not a problem. And another fabricator said, yes, it was a big deal, deal, and they certainly didn't want to deal with it. So it kind of varies from fabricator to fabricator. Although that doubler prep configuration is meant for high seismic applications, it can also be used for wind and low seismic applications. That would also be acceptable. Alternately, for wind and low seismic applications, a fabricator can actually do any kind of weld prep they would like to do on a doubler as long as they perform a weld procedure specification, what we call a WPS, and show that there is sufficient fusion or penetration through the depth of the weld. This would also be acceptable. Alternately, if you're aware that during design that there's going to be some Z loss at the root of the weld, you can simply include this in the design of your weld and provide a PJP weld. We had a project not too long ago in our office where the inspector in the shop did insist on UT testing the welds and a handful were not passing. So we were able to kind of go back and sharpen our pencils and knowing the amount of Z-loss at the root of the weld, we were able to confirm that the strength of a PJP weld was acceptable. So this would also be an acceptable way to go. Now that we discussed the importance, and everyone understands the importance of welding a doubler to the column radius or to the flange because of that horizontal shear stress, 
I do want to say there is one exception in the current state of practice of our industry. And the exception in the current state of practice is at Chevron uh, beam connections. If a doubler is needed to reinforce a Chevron beam for shear, partial depth doublers are, in our current state of practice, are provided. And that is based off the seismic design manual. However, however, there was testing done in 2012 out of the University of Texas that did show partial depth doublers have significant loss of strength and stiffness in the panel zone. So for that reason, if we are designing a Chevron connection and the beam does not have sufficient shear strength and a doubler is required, we will at least bring the doubler as far down as possible while still allowing access to place the fillet weld along the bottom of the doubler. Now if you're wondering why are there doublers in Chevron beams, Okay, I think this would be a reasonable question. This is called the Chevron effect. And if you want, would like to read more about this, there's an excellent discussion in Design Guide 29 written by Bill Thornton and Larry Muir. This is a very simplified free body diagram of what is happening at a Chevron beam. Very simplified. Simply some moments about the weld line. Take the vertical component of the force, the line load at the weld line. 2M over L would be the would be the moment, sum up the vertical components, get to the center line of the beam, which is basically M over D effective of the weld. If the chevron beam does not have sufficient shear for this force, then a doubler is required. That's pretty much the chevron effect, at least the simplified version. All right, doublers welded into the column radius are very expensive, and this weld should be minimized as much as possible. The amount of extension beyond the element delivering the force varies from connection type to connection type. For bolted flange plates and directly welded moment connections, the uh, extension required is 2.5K design of the column. And for bolted end plates, it's 3K design plus thickness of the flange of the end plate. Now that is K design and not K detailing, which can be very beneficial for the larger 14 columns. But even better, in our office, we now limit this doubler extension to six inches max. And where does this come from? Well, the six inches max actually comes from the seismic provisions because for all types of connections in the seismic provisions, the required extension is just six inches. Alternately, if stiffeners are required, the doubler can be welded to the stiffener. If this, in this case, the stiffener to doubler weld does not need to be designed to resist the total force resisted by the doubler. Right? Does not need to be designed for that amount of force. The stiffener to doubler weld per design guide 13 is to be designed for 25% of the total stiffener unbalanced force. If you look at section A, there's four welds. One is to the doubler, so a quarter of the load is resisted by this weld. And at the top and bottom edges of the doubler, Testing has shown there is minimal force at the top and bottom edge, so an AIC minimum weld size is typically provided. Now seismic design is more based on capacity design. So the, the weld of the doubler to the stiffener has to be designed for 75% of the shear yielding strength of the doubler. And at the top and bottom edges, welding is not even required unless equation 3-7 is not satisfied. In equation 3-7 is a minimum doubler thickness based on buckling of the doubler. It's also acceptable to extend the doubler past the stiffener. For wind and low seismic applications, it would just simply then be 50% of the total unbalanced force because the stiffener, both sides of one stiffener are now welded to the doubler. For seismic applications, again, this is more capacity based. So the weld has to resist the maximum force that can ever be transferred to the weld. And that maximum force is the, the minimum of the tension strength of the stiffeners, the shear strength of the stiffeners, or the shear strength of the doubler. All right, well, doubler welds are very costly, and the seismic 
manual does indicate that it's typically more cost effective to increase your column size up to 50 to 100 pounds per foot and have a clean column shaft and eliminate the need for stiffeners and doublers. When I was putting this presentation originally together in January, the cost per steel, average cost per steel at that time was $800 a ton. And for plate, it was even more, it was $881 a ton. By the time I gave this presentation at the steel conference in April, two memos were issued by Steel Dynamics indicating that there was going to be an increase in cost for the price of steel. Just last week, I went to Steel Dynamics website, which is an excellent reference uh, if you want to know the current price per ton of steel, it's given right on their, on their website. This price list was one that I downloaded in January. And last week I looked on their website and there was a 13, about a 13% increase in cost from what it was in January. So the 14 by 90 to 132 columns are over $900 a ton right now. And I'm sure plate is, has gone up way higher than $881 a ton. If you look at this price list, one thing uh, that should be noted that for columns greater than a 14 by 132, so a 14 by 145 to a 14 by 283, the price per ton significantly increases. There's over a $200 per ton increase for the heavier 14 column sizes. So this needs to be considered when evaluating whether it's more cost effective to increase the column size to eliminate the need for stiffeners and doublers. Charlie's Design Guide 13 does have a discussion on the cost of stiffeners and doublers. But keep in mind, this was written in 1999 when the cost per ton of steel was $425 per ton, so significantly less than today's world. But it's still a good data point because the price of steel and the cost of labor have most likely gone up in proportion to each other. So it is still a good reference for the cost of doublers and stiffeners. Well, when we were putting this presentation together in our office, we decided to do our own cost study for doublers and stiffeners. What we did is we took a common configuration, a 14 by 90 column, very, com very commonly used, and had two 24 by 55 beams MoMA connected to a column. And for the moment of 350 feet, we needed a half inch stiffeners and half inch doublers. I think this is a very common connection that we would see on various projects. We then up the column size to get rid of the stiffeners. We then up the column size again to get rid of the doublers. And then we, then we sent this out to steel fabricators for pricing, very steel fabricators. We did include two doubler weld configurations. We had one, detail A, which was a groove welded a doubler, a flush doubler, groove welded into the column radius. And then we also included the option of the thickened doubler that was prepped to clear the column radius and fill it welded to the column flange. All right, so let's take a look at our results. The first line in this column is what we call our baseline, what I would expect to see. Uh, I think this would be the most common because in, in, as an engineer of record, they're thinking to try to minimize the tonnage of the main member. So I do expect this would be the most common, uh, commonly used option for engineer of records. All right, so we're going to give this a cost ratio of 1.0. For the second line in the table, I actually found this very surprising. By doing nothing to the column size, nothing to the stiffeners, and just by using a thickened doubler that was prepped to clear the column radius and to eliminate that groove weld into the radius, just by doing that alone, there was a 25% savings in cost. So this is a very cost effective way to design doublers. For the third line down, we did up the column size to 14 by 109, you know, you know, just under 20 pounds per foot. This also was cost effective. It was a 15% savings in cost, so that's also a better way to go. Although uh, when we did receive pricing from the ver various fabricators, I'm going to be honest, it was all over the place. Um, the pricing, there's a lot of variation in pricing. But one thing was very consistent across the board for all fabricators, and that is the absolute cheapest option 
for all fabricators with the fourth item on this table, the fourth one down. And that is when the column size was increased enough to get rid of the stiffeners and a thickened doubler was used with a single pass 516 fillet weld to the column plant. This was the cheapest option in all cases. And if you're on a project, a price per ton project, and what that means, that means the fabricator on the project is a unit weight job, and the fabricator gets paid based on the tonnage of the project. If you're working for a fabricator on a, on a price per ton project, this, this option is particularly has its advantages because you've increased the tonnage and decreased the shop labor. So this would uh, be the preferred option for fabricators on unit price jobs. Which was somewhat disappointing to me was the last option in the table. Uh, this was disappointing. The option of eliminating the both the stiffeners and the doublers actually came out to be 8% more costly than the baseline. And I think the reason for that is because that jump in price on steel dynamics table for the heavier 14 columns. So now you're entering in a higher price per ton as the column size is over that uh, 14 by 145. We also recently did a doubler study in our own office where we were on a project where we tried to get rid of the doublers or at least reduce them. And the fabricator on that job did determine it was not cost effective. However, I'm not saying that for all jobs, certainly not. If you can increase your column size anywhere, I would say between that 50 to 100 pounds per foot, and especially if you're not entering into the heavier 14s, it most likely is way more cost effective to increase the column size to provide a clean column shaft. You really can't give a discussion or a presentation on, on doublers without discussing who is responsible for the design of the doublers. Well, to help answer this question, it's helpful to go back to the 2005 and 2010 Code of Standard Practice. Section 3.1.1 of the Code of Standard Practice does indicate that column web double plates do need to be shown in sufficient detail on the structural drawings. But, this is a big but, the opening line, the very, very first line of the Code of Standard Practice says, that the provisions of the Code of Standard Practice do apply unless specific instructions are given to the contrary. And engineers in the Midwest and East Coast do exactly that. It's not uncommon at all to give specific instructions to the contrary. If you're a fabricator pricing a job, you want to be very careful to look for this, these exclusions. It can be in the project specifications, or it can be in the typical details, or both. These are examples of, ex of the exclusions that were written in the spec. And here's an example of an exclusion from an actual project or is written in the, in the typical details. So be very, very careful about this if you are pricing a job. Now, problems do occur if the details on the drawings are vague. In this example, the stiffeners are completely designed stiffener welded size. In our office, we would call this uh, EOR mandated. It, that would mean the connection is fully designed and detailed on the structural drawings. And since the stiffener information is so clearly provided, this would lead the fabricator to believe during bidding that the columns do not require doublers, and the EOR has checked the columns for doublers. Now, problems can occur if after the contractor is awarded a job, if an RFI is submitted to the EOR just to confirm that the columns have been checked for doublers and they are not required, and if the answer comes back, no, nope, this is part of the delegated design, and then if the columns do require doublers, most likely the next question is going to be, who's going to pay for the doublers? You really don't want to be in this situation, on either side of this situation, really. To help address this issue, the current 2016 Code of Standard Practice now says that, hey, if you choose option three and you choose to delegate your design, stiffeners and doublers, this is okay. No worries. You can still do this, except for that the quantities and conceptual details need to be placed on the drawings at time of bidding. Now, 
if you are an EOR and you are thinking, <laughs> I don't care, I am still going to exclude this part of the code of standard practice, just be careful because you are kind of rolling the dice on this one. If it does go to court, you are probably not going to win this one, um, especially knowing the reason for the change. Well, talking to a handful of engineer of record folks, uh, I think the, how the industry is going to go is that it will still delegate the design of stiffeners and doublers, but at the time of bidding, an allowance will be placed on the drawings for the fabricators to carry, which I believe is a, a fair way to go. In our office, we use either MathCAD or Excel to design the doublers and stiffeners and check the columns, but they certainly software available out there to do this. One free software is Clean Column, which is uh, free on steel, on, I guess I changed that website, on uh, Clean Column and AISC's website. It works pretty well. I did download it and tried it, and it actually works pretty well. If you look at a free body diagram of a column, it seems quite obvious that there is an increase this year in the column panel zone. You can, it's it seems quite obvious to me. So why is this missed in engineering offices? Well, I think part of the problem is if you look at output, typical outputs from 3D analysis software, I mean this comes from RISA, but nothing against RISA, I think they all would show this, is that the output from the 3D analysis software shows a constant shear in the column and there's no increase from the column center in the, in the column panel zone. And that is because 3D software analyzes member as line elements. And since these members have no depth to them, there is no panel zone in the column. So if you are designing a moment frame, a lateral moment frame, you have to be careful to remember that there is actually a panel zone in the column. If you are delegating the design of the doublers, you must give the actual moment. You can simply say that it is the full moment capacity of the beam, but this will kill a job uh, pretty, pretty quick. It is way over conservative to do that unless that is the actual case. So a much better way to go is to give the actual breakdown of moments, the dead, live, and lateral. You also need the axial load in the column. Why is that? Because axial load in the column can actually greatly reduce the panel zone shear strength of the column, especially if the axial load in the column approaches the squash load. Let me go back. All right. Now at one sided beam to column moment connections, having the actual moments isn't that big of a deal. Well that having the actual moments is a big deal, but having the breakdown isn't such a big deal. And that is because the moment in the beam is the moment in the column. So the breakdown is not that beneficial at one-sided connections. But at two-sided connections, it's very beneficial. And the reason for that, as you can see in the top picture, moments due to gravity act equal and opposite. And since the flange forces are equal and opposite, there really is no shear in the panel zone. There's no panel zone. The shears on each side or the flange forces on each side simply cancel each other out. But the lateral loads act in the same direction so in this case, there would be a panel zone in the column subject to increased shear. Now if the moment is controlled by dead load, which can be the case, then having the breakdown is, can be a huge advantage. And it's for that reason that the breakdown in loads is, is preferred. If we're not given the breakdown loads, one thing that we will do, and I think is pretty common in our industry, we will limit the sum of the B moments to the sum of the column strength. This trick alone can eliminate the need for doublers. It is very beneficial if you have deep 36 beams and small, lighter W12 or W14 columns. This can also help reduce the need for doublers. Even better is it at the top of column where you have two beams and one column. If you are given the breakdown and load, you have dead, live, and lateral on one side, and on the opposite side you have dead and lateral. If live load does not need to be considered, a pattern live load does not need to be considered, then even better, you can put live load on both sides. 
All right. Just to show how beneficial it is to have the actual breakdown of, of theme moments, we did a little study in our office from an actual project. When first we were told to use the full moment capacity of the beams. We went ahead in this case and limited to the strength of the columns for the check of the doublers. But even by doing that, 100% of the columns needed doublers, 100%. We then said, hey, can we have the actual moments? So we were provided the actual moments without any breakdown. It got a little bit better, roughly a 20% reduction of doublers on the, on the project. Around 80% of the columns still needed doublers. We were then given the, the, break, the actual loads with the breakdown of dead, live, and lateral. And for this case, only roughly 26% or 25% roughly of the, of the columns needed doublers. So that is about a 75% savings in cost, which can be quite significant. So it really is worth an engineer's time to give the contractor the actual breakdown of beam moments. And if, that, if this study doesn't convince you, perhaps this picture will. So this is a picture out of Larry Muir and Bill Thornton's Practical Connection Design Seminar that they gave several years ago. Now, they showed this picture with the intention of, of illustrating how beneficial it can be to increase the column size to have a clean shaft. But it can also show, the same picture can be used to illustrate how beneficial it can be just to give the contractor, the fabricator, the actual beam moments. You can see this column has significant distortion due to the size of the doublers and stiffeners. All right, so once you know the load in the column panel zone, the next step is simply to determine the strength of the column in the panel zone, the shear strength of the column. AIC specification section J10.6 contains two sets of equations, one in the elastic range and a higher strength equation for the plastic range. The elastic range equation needs to be used unless the effects of inelastic panel zone deformation were, were included in, in the analysis and considered for the frame stability. If the effects of inelastic panel zone deformation on the stability of the structure in the analysis of the structure were considered in, in the analysis, then you can use the higher plastic range equations. One thing you can see from both of these sets of equations is that they are dependent on the required axial load in the column. And there could be quite a reduction in panel zone shear strength due to axial load in the column. And so a question comes up, when is it appropriate to use the elastic range equation and when is it appropriate to use the plastic range equation? Because you might not ever, I mean you might not know if the effects of uh, inelastic panel zone deformation was considered in the analysis. Well, one school of thought or some discussion that there is in the industry that as long as the engineer record in their analysis did center line to center line analysis with no rigid offsets, then it should be acceptable to use the plastic range equation. However, another school of thought is that no, it's really only applicable to high seismic design. So if you have this question and you're trying to decide which range you fall in, there's an excellent discussion on Risa's website. I highly recommend that you go to Risa's website and read this discussion. It will help guide you into which set of equations is appropriate for your project. <coughs> All right. Once you know the shear in the panel zone and the strength of the column, if the column has insufficient strength, you simply design the doubler to take the balance of the load. To design the doubler, you go to chapter G of the specification. And when sizing the doubler, the area of the doubler is based on the full depth of the column. If a beam frames into the doubler, then this also needs to be considered. Either you can directly add the gravity load to the doubler shear stress, or there's an alternate distribution given in Design Guide 13 and Ichabar Tambuli's book on connection design. It's also discussed in there. With using this alternate distribution, there's no impact to the doubler thickness. So you can also use this. If a doubler is required, 
we typically provide a doubler in our office with a minimum thickness to prevent shear buckling of the doubler. I suppose you could also, if you wanted to, is to provide a doubler less than this thickness and consider shear buckling, but we usually set this as our minimum doubler thickness. Design Guide 13 has a similar equation for shear buckling, a minimum thickness. Now, if you use the equation in Design Guide 13, it will give you a greater minimum thickness to prevent shear buckling than what is used in the current specification. And why is that? Because Design Guide 13 was based on the 1993 spec, and fee for shear in the 1993 spec was 0 0.9, and in the 2016 spec, fee is 1.0 for shear. So that's the difference. That's the reason for the difference. A couple of months ago, I got a call from a steel uh, detailer asking me why I did not plug weld the doubler to the column. At first, I thought I, I must have missed something. So I asked him, why, where did you get this from? Why, why do you think we need to do this? And he said it was based on an equation in the old red book on a minimum thickness of doubler requirement to avoid plug welding. Well, the, the red book is based on the 1978 specification. So if you're using this, this is a bit outdated. For seismic design to prevent buckling, the minimum thickness is based on the depth to width ratio. And if the doubler is plug welded, then you get to use the combined thickness of the column web and the doubler. All right, made my last point on, on doublers. Do not need to even bother to check for doublers at gravity moment connections where the beam sizes are equal and opposite, and the moments are equal and opposite. You don't even have to worry about it. The force just flows through. Although, having said that, it was just yesterday, it was pointed out to me that that's not true if there's an offset. In the case yesterday, there was a 10-inch offset in top of steel elevations. And sure enough, doublers were required at the elevation differences between the flanges. So there are exceptions to that. Or if the beam sizes are not the same. Um, but one thing that can be done, you can, in lieu of providing a doubler, between the beam flanges, is a you can simply slope a stiffener, or perhaps you can add a WT to even out the bottom flanges. And that wraps up our our doubler discussion. Nate, are you going to do a polling question now? Hi, Carol. Yep. Uh, let's let's go ahead and do an interactive polling question on this doubler portion of your presentation. And this is going to be for some audience participation. So here is the audience's question on, on doubler plates. And everybody can just select the answer they think is correct on their computer screen. So the question is this, true or false, at beam to column flange moment connections, doublers are only used to reinforce the column panel zone for shear. Read it again. At beam to column flange moment connections, doublers are only used to reinforce the column panel zone for shear. Is that true or is that false? All right, Carol, the answers are rolling in. And in a moment here, I'll close the poll. OK. So, Carol, we got kind of a split decision on this one. About 60% <laughs> think it's true, and about 40% think it's false. What, okay. what is the correct answer? I'm going to say that maybe this wasn't the best question, <laughs> because this was a little bit of a tricky question, and you really had to be paying attention for the first one minute of this presentation. <laughs> I can understand why people might think that, but no, that is false. You can certainly use doublers to reinforce for other limit states at being the column flange moment connections. It certainly would be okay to do that. Typically, you don't do that, but there are situations in which you can. Which you can. The only limit state when you're checking for stiffeners that you cannot use a doubler to reinforce for is flange bending due to tension load applied to the flange. And we're going to see more about that in the upcoming or second part of this presentation. But for all other limit states, yeah, you, you could actually count on the doublers 
But having said that, conventionally you do not do that, but it certainly would be acceptable. So kind of a tricky question. Sounds good. So I'm going to go back to where we left off and turn the floor back over to you for the next portion of the presentation. All right. Sorry about that tricky question, everybody. <laughs> All right. For the last part of our presentation, we're going to be talking about stiffener plates. Stiffeners are just like doublers where they're used to reinforce a column or a member for the required loading. Today's presentation is mainly going to focus on stiffeners required to reinforce the column at beam the column flange moment connection. You can certainly use stiffeners for other applications, such as at column bearing on beam connections or beam bearing on column connections. At beam bearing on top of column connections or any kind of bearing connections, the manual part two has an excellent discussion on uh, stability stiffeners at beam bearing on top of column connections. Even if you do not need the stiffener at these types of connections for strength, you might very well still need them for stability. Uh, the manual part two has an excellent discussion on this. They can also be used to brace the work point at chevron brace connection. But if you think about it, a much better way to brace the work point at chevron bracing is to have a perpendicular infill beam that frames directly into the work point that has a connection that covers at least three quarters of the depth of the chevron beam. This is a much better way to provide uh, bracing to the work point. Chapter, uh, specification section J10.7 also does indicate that the ends the unframed ends of beams do need to be restrained against rotation about their longitudinal axis. If the beam is unrestrained against rotation, unframed end of a beam is unrestrained, then a pair of full depth stiffeners does need to be provided. Now full depth in this case it doesn't actually mean full depth. It is acceptable to terminate the stiffeners at a distance k detail from the top flange. And you can also just simply put a plate at the end of the member. This is also discussed in part two of the manual. Another excellent use of stiffeners is to direct the force. Stiffeners are an excellent way to tell the force which way you want it to go. In this case over here, this is a welded truss connection. And if we would have taken this flange force perpendicular through the web diagonal, a doubler would have been needed in this section of the web member of the diagonal. We wanted to avoid this, and we actually wanted to take the axial load directly across the joint. So how did we do this? We simply used a stiffener. And how did we know the force would go in the direction we wanted to? Because force is attracted to stiffness. Using stiffeners to direct the force is an excellent use of stiffeners. If a stiffener is required, the minimum width of stiffener is one-third the beam flange minus half the column web. The minimum thickness of stiffener, if it's required, is not the thickness of the beam flange or of a flange plate. That is not the minimum thickness. The minimum thickness, per the specification, is one-half the thickness of the element delivering the force. There is also a minimum thickness to prevent buckling of the stiffener, and that is simply the width over 16. And where the width over 16 comes from, it's based on buckling of a plate that is fixed on one end, simply supported on the other, and free on the other end. If you would like to read more on this equation, and it's an excellent reference, is the book Welded Interior Beam to Column Connections that you can probably find online. It's an old book uh, written by AISC. Now for seismic provisions, it's very similar. The minimum width is half the beam flange minus half the column web thickness. For one side connections, it's half the beam flange thickness, and for two-sided connections, that does go up to three-quarters of the beam flange thickness. Now for all limit states except for web crippling, web buckling, and part J10.7 for unframed ends of beams, for all other limit states, partial depth stiffeners are acceptable. Now you might be on top of your game, and you might, if you happen, you might have, if you, I don't know if anybody's noticing this, but in the 2010 specification, 
past death stiffeners were acceptable for web crippling. And, but now in the 2016 specification, the minimum stiffener depth for web crippling is three quarters the depth of the member. Why the change? It's based on a 2015 EJ article written by Saul Carr in that he did testing of various stiffener configurations, and it was shown in testing that half depth stiffeners were not effective in resisting or strengthening for web crippling. Is this a big deal? Probably not at all. There's a minimal cost increase, if any, for extending the stiffener down as long as a three-sided weld is not required. I, we in our office will, will avoid providing stiffeners that are extended all the way down to the opposite flange, and you certainly don't need to do that. Fitting a stiffener in for a three-sided weld is more costly and should be avoided. Also in the salt car article, and I would agree with him on this, is that the specification really doesn't give any guidance for the design of partial depth stiffeners. And in the EJ article, he does give a procedure. In our office, we also recognize this. And one thing that we do is that we design partial depth stiffeners based on the bracket procedure in part 15 of the manual. One of the things that is on my to-do list is to actually compare the two procedures and see how they compare. I suspect they would compare pretty well. Stiffeners at columns do need to be clipped along the web. The clip needs to clear K detailing, and along the flange, the clip needs to, kill, to clear K1. There is no provisions against welding in the K area for wind and low seismic applications. The K area is defined as the area in the column one and a half inches past the column radius. Highly restrained welds in the K area have led to cracking of W section members in the fabrication process. And the reason for that is W-shaped members that are rotary straightened have a lower notch toughness in the K area. To help solve this issue, testing has shown that although there's no restrictions against welding in a K area, to help prevent the cracking in the K area, that an inch and a half clip can be provided and the weld stops short by one weld size. Now for seismic design, welding in the K area is not allowed. Your clip does have to clear the K area and be held back one weld size. And to the column flange, you have to clear the K1 plus a half inch, and you have the same quarter inch pullback. For wind and low seismic, the weld of the stiffener to the column flange does not need to be sized for the full strength of the stiffener. Several years ago, this was the case. In older specifications, this was required. But in the current specification, the weld of the stiffener to the column flange only needs to be sized for the required load. But in the seismic provisions, the weld of the stiffener to the column flange does need to be a CJP groove weld. For the column web, for the stiffener to column web, that weld for wind and low seismic only needs to be designed for the unbalanced force in the stiffener. So basically, at equal and opposite gravity cantilevered moment connections, there is no, if the load is equal and opposite, there's technically no load at the stiffener to column web. For seismic, seismic design, the seismic precisions, the weld of the stiffener to the column web based on capacity, so it would be based on the maximum load that weld would, would ever be delivered to the weld. And the maximum load is based on the minimum of the sum of the tension strength, the shear strength of the stiffener, or the shear strength of the column web, or doubler if one is present. And once you know the column flange force, you check it for the applicable limit states in section J10 of the specification. And whatever the stiffener, uh, whatever the column does not have sufficient strength, whichever limit state controls, stiffeners are designed to take the balance of the load. If, this, if the stiffener is subject to compression uh, buckling, if KL over R the stiffener is less than 25, and you don't have to really check it for buckling, yielding will control. If it's greater than 25, then you have to treat it more like a column and go to chapter E of the specification. So let's go over the applicable limit states. 
First one, going right through the list, J10.1 is for tension flange bending. Now this is the one limit state where a doubler is not going to do you any good. If you would like to read more about the derivation of this limit state, there is an excellent discussion in Omer Blodgett's book, The Design of Welded Structures, where he discusses the yield line used to derive this equation. It's an excellent discussion in that book. Be careful if your flange is closer than a distance 10 times the thickness of the column flange near the end of the column, then you will have a 50% reduction in strength for tension flange bending. Next is, is local web yielding, where the flange delivers a force to the column, where the beam flange or flange plate delivers a force to the column flange and it spreads to the column web through the distance k of the column and that spread is 2 and a half to 1 each side. If you're closer than a distance d to the end of the column, then you only get to count on the 2 and a half to 1 spread on one side. J10.3 okay, is for web crippling. What web crippling is, you can see there's a little ripple in the column web just below the column flange, and this is more applicable to compression loading. There's three sets sets of equations in J10.3. The first one is if you're away from the end of the member, and the other two if you're closer than a distance d over 2 from the end of the member, and these are based on the bearing length to, to column depth ratio. You might be wondering what this Q sub f factor is in these equations. This is new in the 2016 specification. Well, the good news is for W-shaped sections, Q sub F equals 1. This is really more applicable to HSS members. And why is it in Chapter J and not Chapter K? Well, this would be a good question. So the 2010 specification, there was duplication of limit states in both Chapter J and Chapter K. So the same limit states were given in both chapters of the specification. To get rid of this duplication, the limit states were removed from Chapter K and placed in Chapter J, for better or for worse, that is the way it is now. And since the strength of an HSS for web crippling is dependent upon the, the, the stress in the cord, the Q sub factor has to be considered when checking for web crippling. Well, that is the reason why it is now in section J10.3 of the specification. Same Q sub F on web compression buckling. Web compression buckling is really meant to be checked at, let's say, gravity cantilever moment connections where the bottom flanges of the beam apply an equal and opposite compression load to the column. This is really meant for the application of web compression buckling. Here is a picture of the testing setup. You can see that both flanges of the beam are braced and a point load is applied to the beam. This is really the intent of this equation. This equation should not be used if the flanges of the supporting member are unbraced. In this case, there will be buckling interaction between the member delivering the force and the supporting member. If you're designing this type of connection, the reference chapter C and appendix 6 on stability. And also, if the bearing length to the depth of the column is large, approximately greater than 1, then this equation is not applicable. It's really more meant for small point loaded areas. If it's greater than 1, then the web should be checked more as a column using chapter E. If checking all the limit states, stiffeners are not required, it still doesn't mean in seismic design you do not need to provide stiffeners. Even if the column has sufficient strength, a stiffener is still required if the thickness of the column flange is less than the width of the beam over 6. Design Guide 13 also discusses eccentric stiffeners, and the eccentricity of the stiffener is measured from the center line of the beam flange to the center line of the stiffener. This is what we call the stiffener eccentricity. Design Guide 13 limits the maximum stiffener eccentricity to 2 inches. However, at this maximum 2 inch eccentricity, the stiffener is considered only 65% effective. If you're somewhere between 0 and 2 inches, we simply interpolate between 100% effective and 65% effective. But it should be noted that this 65% effectiveness is based on testing done by Graham in 1959, and it's only based on one test. 
So AISD, knowing this, is currently doing research on eccentric stiffeners to confirm the findings of this one test. One thing that can be done to eliminate the stiffener eccentricity is simply slope the stiffener from flange to flange, which works well unless perhaps you might have a beam moment connected to the column web. Well, that covers all the applicable limit states that we would use a beam to column flange moment connection. There is a couple other limit states in, in part J10 of the specification that are more applicable to beams and girders. And I thought it might be good just to go over these quickly. But these limit states are not really applicable at beam to column flange moment connections. The first one is web side sway buckling. And this is where a, an axial compression load is applied to the top compression flange and either it's restrained or unrestrained, and the opposite bottom tension flange is shown to buckle sideways in testing. There's two sets of equations for web side sway buckling. The first equation is if the compression flange is restrained, and the second lower equation is if the compression flange is unrestrained. LB in this equation is not the bearing length. LB is the maximum unbraced length of both the top or bottom flange. You take the maximum of the two, and that's what LB is. If you're checking web side sway buckling and you have insufficient strength, if your top flange is restrained by such things as like a slab, studs in a slab, then stiffeners or doublers can be provided to strengthen the section. However, if your top flange is unrestrained, then stiffeners cannot be provided. In this particular case, then out-of-plane bracing needs to be provided. Also, girders with point loads applied need to be checked as a built-up section. The web needs to be built, checked as a built-up section. For interior connections, the effective width of web is 25 times the thickness of the web. And at end connections, the effective length of web is 12 times the thickness of the web. Now for these connections, these type of connections, if you have a high compression load, one thing that we will do in our office, very cost effective, is we will finish one side of the stiffener to bear and provide a minimum 5 16 inch fillet weld. On the opposite side, on the opposite side, we will size the weld to transfer the required load. Either a fillet weld, a heavy fillet weld, a PJP, or even a CJP, would be more cost effective. And why is that? Because if you require both ends of the stiffener to bear, the fabricator kind of has to fit the stiffener in, take it out, file it down, fit it in, take it out, file it down. So both ends would be fitted to bear. And this can be a very time consuming process. For that reason, only one end of the stiffener is usually chosen to be designed to fit to bear. OK, we're in the last part of our presentation now. Are we going to do a polling question, or Nate, or just continue on? Uh, we'll reserve that for, for the end, Carol. All right, so we're... Really Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, that pretty much... All right, that pretty much concludes our discussion on stiffeners. And just to put this all together, we're going to do a final example where we check a column for stiffeners and doublers, and then we size the stiffeners and doublers. And I'm going to say that this example is very loosely based on an actual, actual, uh, I guess I'm going to say problem or design that we had in our office. So pretty close to the actual condition. And on this project, we were given the dead, live, and lateral forces, dead, live, and earthquake. This is an R equal three project, so seismic provisions are not required. R equal three. Now, just because the wind load wasn't given doesn't mean there wasn't wind load. It's just that the engineer record predetermined that wind was not going to control, so there's no need giving it to us. To determine uh, the first thing to do to determine the maximum moment, oh, I'll just skip this slide. This just indicates that what we're going to be doing. The um, first thing to do is to determine the maximum moment. To determine the maximum moment, AFC7 load combinations can be used. Now it was pretty obvious that load cage number five was going to control, but we went ahead and worked out all the load cases just to prove it. And sure enough, load case five does control, and the maximum moment is 1,070 kip feet. So this is the moment that we're going to use to check for stiffeners. 
Divide the moment by the effective moment arm. For flange plate connections, that's simply D plus the thickness of the flange plate. And for directly welded moment connections, the effective depth would be D minus the thickness of the flange. Just go to the center line of the flanges. We have a flange force of 491 tips, and this is what we're going to size the stiffeners for. All right, we'll just go through all the applicable yield the limit states. For checking stiffeners, first one is web local yielding. And uh, LB in this case is just simply the thickness of the flange. And that comes to 427 kips, which is less than 491 kips. So right off the bat, we already need stiffeners. Then we check web crippling. We're, towards the, we're not near the end of the member, so we just use the higher strength equation. And this comes to 672 kips, greater than 491, OK. Next, we're going to check web compression buckling. And I suppose it's uh, questionable if this limit state would even apply, but we're going to go ahead and check it. It comes to 1,305, yeah, which is substantially greater than the 491 tips. OK, doesn't even control anyway. And for determine the height or the clear height of the column, you want to make sure to use K design and not K detailing, because you don't want to overestimate the strength of the column web. Then we're checking flange bending, which is based on the column flange thickness, the yield line. And that comes to 483 kips, which is also less than 491 kips. No good. Now, you can certainly go through all these equations. And if you're using Excel or MathCAD, I would absolutely do that. But if you would like to check someone or a quick reference to see if your numbers are correct, you can simply go to the manuals, the tables in the manual. Table 4-1-A can be used. And we're, first, we're going to check web yielding. For that, you use PW0 plus PWI times L sub E. We get the same 427 kips for web yielding. No good. Stiffener is still required. Now, web crippling is not included in Table 4-1A. But that doesn't mean you don't have to check web crippling. You still have to check web crippling. But to use the manual, you have to go to Table 9-4 and use Equation 950-A. And the reason why we have to multiply it by 2 is because this table is based on the connection at the end of the number. So that's the reason we multiply it by 2, 672 kips. Now for web buckling, we go back to table 4-1A. Web buckling, we get 1,310, basically the same. The only difference between this and the number we previously gotten is that AIC manual is based on three significant figures. If we would have based ours on three significant figures, we would have gotten the exact same number. Now, if you are towards the end of the member, then these values in Table 4-1A do need to be cut in half for that flange. Next, we'll check local flange bending. We get 483 kits, the exact same number that we previously got. All right, so now we're going to size our stiffeners. First, we determine the force in the stiffener, which is exactly the flange force minus the least of all the available strengths. Web yielding control, so 427 kips. That gives 64 kips total. Each stiffener takes 32 kips. Our minimum stiffener width, based on a third of the beam flange minus half the web, is 2.92 inches. But then we have to determine our maximum stiffener width based on the column flange width minus half the column web width. And that's 7.44. For our example purposes, you could certainly provide something different, but we're just going to choose a nice, clean 7-inch stiffener width. The next thing is to do is determine the minimum stiffener thickness. So the, the first criteria is the width over 16 comes to 0.438, or half the thickness of the element delivering the force. In this case, that would be the beam flange. If it was a flange plate, you would use half the flange plate thickness. This comes to 0.373 inches. So we're going to use, let's just try a half inch stiffener. The minimum snip at the corner is then based on K detailing of the column, K detailing minus thickness of the flange, K1 minus half the thickness of the web, or that 1.5 that we discussed earlier. This, these all basically come to 1.5. I suppose if you wanted to provide a 1.5 inch clip along the web and something less along the flange, that would be OK too. But let's just use an inch and a half for both. Checking the, the stiffener for tension yielding, we take the force in the stiffener, 32 kips, divided by 0.9 FY, because we're using LRFD, divided by the effective width 
of the stiffener at the flange, so five and a half inches. Comes to 0.129 inches, less than a half, okay. All right, the next thing to do is check the stiffener for buckling. Uh, our KL over R is 65.5 or greater than 25, so we then have to uh, go to chapter E. Our limit is less than, uh, our KL over R is less than the limit, so F critical can be determined from equation E3-2. C of critical equals 32.9. Now, for checking buckling of the stiffener, the total width of stiffener can be used. Using the total width, we get a uh, stiffener required of 0.139 inches, less than a half, okay. Now, just as a side note, if you use an Excel math cat, there's no problem calculating the critical buckling stress. But to do a quick hand, do a quick check in a table, you can simply go to table 4-14 in the steel manual. It's a nice little reference. We then size the stiffener weld to the column flange. Take the stiffener force divided by 1.392 times 2, because there's two welds, one top, one bottom, divided by 5.5, .5, which is the length of weld, divided by 1.5 equals 1.39 16th of an inch, so quarter inch fill weld. Now you might ask two questions here. What is the 1.392 and what is the 1.5? All right, these are very good questions. If you do a lot of connection design, these are very common terminologies. And there's nothing but the shear strength of the weld based on the number of sixteenths of the weld size. For ASD, this is 0.928D and 1.392D for LRFD. These, these are very common terminology used by connection designers. And you can confirm these just by punching out the shear strength of the weld metal. 0.6 FEXX times 0.707 to get to the effective throat of the weld, so 45 degrees. And D is just the number of sixteenths. And for ASD, you divide by omega, which is 2. And for LRFD, you multiply by the resistance factor phi, which is 0.75. And the 1.5 comes from the spec equation J2-5. And that is, test has shown that welds loaded perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the weld have an increase in strength. And for the angle between the weld, the, the, the axis of the weld, and the applied load, when that's 90 degrees, there is a 50% increase of strength. All right, so that wraps up the stiffeners, and now we're going to go to the doublers. Same exact load, same exact load combination. Now, in this particular case, we need to determine for each load combination the maximum sum of the flange forces. And this is what we're going to use to check the panel zone. So for each individual load combination, we're going to determine the flange force. We kind of know load combination is going to control, so we'll just jump to this one. The moment on one side is 1,070 kick feet, but the moment on the other, we're not going to use live load. That would only help matters if we use live load. But the moment on the other side, the dead and the lateral act in opposite directions, so the moment there is reduced to 534 kick feet. The flange force for the first side, side one, is 491 kips same that we just used to check for stiffeners. But on the second side, for this load combination, the flange force is only 245 kips. So on that side, actually stiffeners are not even required. Is that important? Yes, that is important. Why? Because we need to know this information when checking the stiffener weld to the doubler because we need to know the total unbalanced force in the stiffener. So you'll see that in just a second here. So our total flange force for checking the column panel zone is side 1 plus side 2 equals 736 kips. All right. Now even though the actual loads were given to us in this example, which is true, we will still in our office check that the sum of the beam moments does not exceed the sum of the column strength. As you can see that there was some major grouping going on in this case. It just happened that all the dead and all the lateral equaled the exact same on the whole project. So for that reason, due to the grouping, we would most likely go ahead and still check this. In this particular case, the sum of the column strength is 2,400 kip feet, so it is it's significantly okay. The next thing to do is determine the shear in the column. This can be used to reduce the panel zone shear strength. To determine the shear in the column, just simply, simply sum moments about the inflection point of the column. 
For the inflection point, this can be assumed to act at the mid-height of the column. The summing moments about the mid-height, we get a shear in the column of 107 kips. So the shear in the panel zone is, uh, is reduced from, can reduce the the shear in the panel zone is reduced, and we get 629 kips of shear in the panel zone. We then are now we're just going to check the column for shear in the panel zone. Alpha, alpha is a variable used in the 2016, and what alpha is is alpha equals 1 for LRFD and 1.6 for ASD. Alpha is used to compare a required load to the yield strength of, a me of, of this member. So in our case, the yield strength is just FYAG of the column, comes to 2590 kips. Alpha PR is just the required load divided by PY, comes to 0.336, which is less than 0.4. Since it's less than 0.4, there is no reduction of shear strength in the column panel zone due to axial load in the column. We then determine our required uh, our strength of our column, 0.9, P is 0.9 for this case, for shear. 0.6 FY times the depth of the column times the thickness of the column width comes to 391 kips, which is greater than the shear in the panel zone of 629, so uh, no doubt a doubler is required. To determine the shear force in the doubler, we just simply take the difference between the shear in the panel zone and the strength of the column, it comes to 288 kips. And for now, we're just going to assume one doubler. Well, maybe we'll provide two, but for now, let's just assume one. Determine the minimum thickness of doubler per specification section G2.1 to prevent shear buckling. That's 0.211 inches, pretty minimal, so that would be fine. We then size the doubler based on section G of the specification. You go to section G to size doublers. And per chapter G, using uh, equation G2-1, we get a doubler thickness of 0.632 inches is the required doubler thickness. Now, in this equation, you get to use the total depth of the column when sizing the doubler. Now, if we had a beam framing into the column web, this also has to be considered. In this particular case, let's just say that we have a beam framing into one side of the column web. So we're going to go ahead and use one doubler so we don't have to have a beam framing into the doubler. This is always preferred. If you do have a beam framing into a doubler, that's okay. It just needs to be considered in the design of the doubler. But for our case, we're going to set that to zero, and so there's no impact to our doubler because the shear load is zero. And then the minimum required doubler thickness would either be that based on shear buckling or that required for the required loads. And that comes to 0.632 inches. Let's just provide one three-quarter inch doubler. Probably would also, it would, certainly would be okay uh, most likely to provide two three-eighths inch doublers if you wanted to do that. All right, now we have to check the stiffener weld to the doubler. The total unbalanced force in the stiffeners is simply 32 kips in one stiffener because the other, remember, side two didn't even require stiffeners. So the total unbalanced force is 32 kips. So the minimum size doubler at the stiffener to doubler weld is 0.056 inches. Okay, less than three quarters. And then we have to check the stiffness, the, the thickness of the stiffener for shear. And that's based on the available length at the weld. It comes to 0.111 inches, less than a half inch. OK. We then have to, what are we doing next? <laughs> we then have to size the weld of the stiffener to the column web. And that's based on the available length, 9.6 inches. And that comes to 1.2 of an inch, so that's quarter inch weld. Okay. We then, last step, we then have to check that we have a, uh, the minimum thickness of stiffener and of column web to make sure the thickness is enough to develop the required fillet weld. In this case, it's more than enough. In these equations, we just base the shear rupture strength. We equal that to the, the the strength, the shear strength of the weld, we get 0.119 inches, 0.114 inches for both checks, which is less than the thickness of the stiffener and less than the thickness of the column length. Okay, and that's it. And in the end, this is our our detail. All right, just to summarize, 
Doublers are required to resist shear forces exceeding the column panels on shear strength. AWS, AWS D1.8 can be used for pre-qualified doubler weld configuration. Sufficient information is needed to properly check for column web doublers. It can be very cost effective to increase the column size to eliminate the need for stiffeners and doublers. Stiffeners are required to resist uh, applied loads that are greater than the strength of the column. And all the applicable limit states are given in J.10 of the specification. And that pretty much concludes our presentation for today. All right. Thank you, Carol. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of time here to answer some questions from the audience. Uh, but first, as Carol alluded to earlier, there is another polling question uh, that we are going to test the audience on. This one is about the stiffener portion of Carol's presentation. So this is another true or false question. True or false? For wind and low seismic applications, the stiffener welds to the column flange should develop the full strength of the stiffener. Is that A, true, or B, false? So I'll read it one more time. For wind and low seismic applications, the stiffener welds to the column flange should develop the full strength of the stiffener. Okay, Carol, the answers are rolling in. I'll give just one more second here for a few more folks to, to respond and close the poll. So it looks like almost 90% of our audience thinks that that statement is false. Carol, what is the correct answer? Okay, well this one, what good news, this is not a trick question, and that is correct. It certainly is false. I bet that the 18 responses that said true are, or 10 percent, are old timers because it certainly used to be true, and sometimes we still get questions on that today. Uh, but in the current specification, you do not need to do that. You just have to design it for the unbound, for the for the required loading. All right. Well, good job, everyone. So now we'll just field a few questions from the audience that that came in during the presentation, Carol. And the first question that we'll go through is on slide 24. Okay. So that question is, on slide 24, at partial height double, doubler plates and chevron braces, you mm -hmm. show the dimension of Y over 2 minimum. If we want to get that doubler as close as possible to the flange, should it be Y over 2 maximum? Or is the minimum dimension to allow for weld access? Well, that is correct. The minimum, act, uh, the minimum dimension is to allow for weld access. That is correct. And this comes right out of the manual where they give them minimum dimensions to provide sufficient weld access. However, Bo's upcoming article also discusses tolerances for weld access. So this might be slightly modified once Bo's article is, is published. But this is based on information in the 15th edition manual. So yes, that is correct. And the reason why we don't bring it all the way down is because it's very costly. And since that's not the current state of practice, uh, we kind of just kind of go along with, with the seismic manual. All right. Our next question brings us to slide 34, is on this cost comparison that you put together. So on this slide 34, the question is, is there any schedule difference information that you obtained when you did this study? Like, uh, honestly, we just sent this out to fabricators, and then they sent us their cost. And then from their cost, that was the only thing we received is their cost. And then once we received their cost, we, we kind of took that and formatted, formatted that to a cost ratio to give comparisons. So the only thing we received is straight up cost for the different options from the steel fabricator. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's the only thing that we received. I think it does. So okay. we'll go to slide 48. Somebody was wondering if you could explain again why is live load only considered on one side of the connection in this, in this um, situation? Now, 
Live load is only considered on one side if pattern live load needs to be considered. If pattern live load does not need to be considered, then we absolutely put live load on both sides because it will honestly reduce the sum of the moments in the panel zone. So that's the reason why we try to put it on both sides, but sometimes you can't get away from it and you have to consider pattern live load. All right. Slide 58. The question here is on the detail on the lower right of this slide. And the question is, how do you determine the length of that WT and that WT weld uh, to the beam? No, oh, I like that question. That's a very good question. So the answer to that would be, is I would typically size that. Uh, so the weld, which you design from the shear times the moment, you have to consider a moment at that weld. So that weld size that, that is required is 5 sixteenths or under. I like to provide a single pass weld. Also, you have to check the member above for yielding and crippling and make sure stiffeners are not required. So you just make your length long enough for that. And typically, uh, typically, and it usually comes out to somewhere around twice the depth or some ratio of the depth. But you really do have to check it for the forces. Uh, I might say most engineers would probably stick with one foot then, but you you really need to to run the the numbers on it. But it's usually based on well size to answer the question. All right. So the next question is on slide 98 on this example. How did you come up with k equals 0.75 in this situation? Well, that is actually given in the specification. So that comes right out of the spec. All right. And that's Here's a general question on the idea of moment connections without stiffeners. Does the moment connection without stiffeners have the same behavior than with the stiffeners? Can we consider rigid moment connections if you don't have the stiffeners? Yes, I think you can. The only time you need to put in stiffeners is if they're required based on strength purposes, for it being the column flange moment connections, or in seismic design if based on the column flange thickness. There is no need to put in stiffeners if they're not required for strength. You can still consider it a rigid connection. It less, might be less rigid, but it's still considered a rigid connection. All right. Well, thank you very much, Carol. That's all the time we have for questions today. A special thanks to Carol Drucker for presenting to us today, and thank you all for your participation.